let me begin. Uh, Nietzsche's thought of the eternal return of the same has been captivating the interest of philosophers in various ways. Firstly, because it has come to be believed, partly under the influence of uh, high-profile interpretations, such as those of Heidegger and Deleuze, that it is the eternal return of the same that constitutes the hard-to-reach pinnacle of Nietzsche's ontology. The eternal recurrence is thus widely regarded as Nietzsche's unfinished thesis on being qua being, which interconnects other key components of his philosophy, such as the perhaps most notoriously the critique of metaphysics and the ontological trinity of the will to power, becoming, and life. The second direction of considerations foregrounds, let's say, the existential or the existentialist dimension. The idea of uh, the eternal return uh, that Nietzsche on one of the very rare occasions he referred to it directly in his published work described as the highest attainable formula of affirming life is in this respect perceived primarily as a doctrine of life, in simplest terms as a doctrine that teaches us how to live life in a different way in order to cure an existential sickness that has become inherent to human existence. Even though it is quite possible that this cure, this new attitude towards life, would eventually destroy us. This ultimately leads us to the, the third much discussed and perhaps most controversial aspect, to the understanding of the eternal return in terms of a selective thought, a thought that will transform those who are able to endure it in a fundamental sense and kindly enable others to gradually regress into more pleasant animality. In this respect, Deleuze is, of course, to be greatly commended for showing that there's much more to be seen in this doctrine of selection than just an obscure idea of segregation. All in all, I believe these are the three most common emphasized aspects of the thought of the eternal recurrence. The ontological, which also includes the, the critique of metaphysics or Nietzsche's anti-metaphysics, as some authors tend to say, the existential and the selective aspect. Then, of course, the argument itself, such as we know it, is cosmological in, in, its, in its, uh, 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 the deduction of eternal return. In this essay, however, I will try to point out another, one might say fourth or even fifth aspect of eternal return, which I would describe as epistemological. When I say epistemological, this is to be taken in a slightly modified sense. At the time when the idea of eternal return first appears in his unpublished writings in August 1881, Nietzsche was indeed intensely preoccupied with an epistemological question. This question, however, is not the question of the conditions of knowledge, but a question of how to bring a truth to life. This is not the same question. In fact, uh, as we'll see in, in the context of Nietzsche, one could, it almost amounts to an op opposite of these two questions, of the question of the conditions of knowledge and the question of how to bring a truth to life. Now, regarding this truth itself, there's nothing so special about it. It is not even a question of Nietzsche claiming it as some, uh, gr uh, some great discovery of his own since in the broadest sense he regarded this truth as an increasingly recognized consequence of scientific discoveries. Furthermore, this truth does not arouse excitement, but rather, as Nietzsche writes, it takes us to an impassable frontier, to a wall that cannot be broken through with the tools of thought at our disposal, since these tools of thought are made of the same material as the wall itself. This truth can uh, thus only be articulated negatively as the truth of the non-existence of substances. The whole problem is that substantialism, although we have long since outgrown it as a philosophical worldview, remains unassailable as long as we remain trapped in the clasp of language. In Nietzsche, namely, the classical epistemological opposition between the subject and the object, between the interiority of our experience and the external world, 
is underpinned by another opposition, that of language and becoming. This opposition obviously has Hegelian roots. Mladen Dollar, for instance, wrote extensively on this issue, and he also developed a polemic with Jean-Luc Nancy, who wrote a famous book on, on the so-called Hegel's speculative remark. So it, is, it has some sort of history in Hegelianism. What is distinctly Nietzschean, though, and the reason why the opposition between language and becoming is, in fact, formative of the subject-object relation is that, according to Nietzsche, our consciousness itself is the result of the suppression of becoming by means of language. The world of what we perceive as entities, their properties and relations, the world of things that supposedly persist unchanged in time, thus orienting us in our surroundings, is, according to Nietzsche, primarily a reflection of the structure of language projected outwardly and imposed on becoming. And also that vital illusion that not only haunts the subject, but which ultimately is the subject, the sensation of being an individual needs to be, broadly speaking, related to the same source. This, however, does not mean that consciousness as such is an illusion. Rather, I'd say that for Nietzsche, the human consciousness is existentially fiction-dependent, not so much different from a belief, and remote from the epicenter of what he calls a true life system. To show how intensely was Nietzsche preoccupied with this line of questioning when the thought of eternal recurrence first appeared in his writings, let's take a glimpse at one of the many examples from this period. I quote Nietzsche's unpublished notebook M3. In truth, there are no individual truths, but only individual errors. The individual himself is an error. Everything that goes on in us is in itself something else that we do not know. We first put the intention and the evasion and morality into nature. But I distinguish the imagined individuals and the true life systems, each of which is one of us. One throws both into one, while the individual is only a sum of conscious feelings and judgments and errors, a belief a piece of uh, the true life system or many pieces thought together and wired together, a unit that does not hold up. We are buds on a tree. What do we know about what can become of us in the interest of the tree? But we have a consciousness as if we wanted and should be everything, a fantasy of I and all not me. Now, what's most important is that, according to Nietzsche, this epistemological barrier that is not only imposed on us, but also sustains us, cannot be set aside, at least not at the level of conscious thinking. I quote again, this time from Will to Power, that is from later period. We now read disharmonies and problems into things because we think only in the form of language and thus believe in the eternal truth of reason, e.g. subject, attribute, etc. We cease to think when we refuse to do so under the constraint of language. We barely reach the doubt that sees this limitation as limitation. Rational thought is interpretation according to a scheme that we cannot throw off." End of quote. The only thing we can reach in this regard by means of rationality that is itself informed by the structure of language, says Nietzsche, is doubt. An awareness of limitation of our rationality that cannot uh, throw off the matrix of substantiality. And yet Nietzsche, during those same days when he first conceived of the idea of eternal recurrence, appears having commenced believing that he had discovered a means to move beyond this limitation. Now, if the truth itself, the non-existence of substances, is slightly boring, 
This certainly cannot be said of the way how Nietzsche conceived of it, of its invoking into life. To bring a truth to life means, according to Nietzsche, that this truth needs to be smuggled piece by piece among what he calls the embodied errors. Or, and this means the same for Nietzsche, precisely the same, among the unconscious instincts. I quote again, notebook M3. When we gradually formulate the contradictions to all of our fundamental opinions, we approach the truth. First of all, it is a cold, dead world of concepts. We combine it with our other errors of instincts and thus draw a piece at a time in the life inside. In the adaptation to the living errors can alone the first ever dead truth be brought to life." End of quote. Two essential points can be immediately noted. Firstly, truth, according to Nietzsche, cannot be brought into the circulation of life by means of articulating it as clearly as possible in its abstract form, or, being, or by being constantly aware of it. Awareness doesn't do the trick. On the contrary, for a truth to have an effect on life, we must invent a way of assimilating this truth in camouflage to vital mistakes, thus plunging it into the death of the instinctive where things actually work. The process of reviving a truth means, in fact, to push this truth into the unconscious, which in in one way or another, dictates its conscious oblivion. One might also say to invent a form in which this truth can persist as forgotten. The second emphasis concerns what we might prudently call Nietzsche's conception of the unconscious. We can see that the unconscious in Nietzsche's sense, and I don't think there is necessarily much difference with psychoanalysis, at least as far as the essential emphasis I'm trying to make here is concerned, is not in itself the site of the great truth, the arc of all mysteries. The unconscious in Nietzsche's sense is above all else the sphere of action of conflicting instincts which are nothing other than the embodiment of those vital errors which over the hundreds of thousands of years of the microevolution of the human being and its predecessors have proved to be the preconditions of its survival. For example, of our experiencing of ourselves as individuals, our perception of persisting entities, the pleasure in introverted cruelty, etc. The unconscious itself is therefore a realm of embodied errors, but a realm of errors that unlike the abstract truths, the truths revealed within consciousness are actually acted upon. For this reason then we can paradoxically say that the truth can only be brought to life if it acquires the form of an embodied mistake. Let us, take, uh, uh, let us look at another dense passage from the same period. I'm, I quote, again, it is Nietzsche's notebook, M3. In order for there to be any degree of consciousness in the world, an unreal world of error had to arise. Beings with the belief in perseverance, in individuals, etc. Only after an imaginary counter world had arisen in contradiction to the absolute flow could anything on this basis arise as what can be recognized. Yes, in the end, the fundamental error can be seen on which everything is based, because opposites can be thought. But this error cannot be destroyed otherwise than with life. The ultimate truth of the flow of things does not tolerate incorporation. Our organs for life are prepared for error. This is how the con uh, contradiction of life and its ultimate decisions arises in the wise. 
His drive to knowledge presupposes belief in error and life in it, end of quote. Truth, such as the non-existence of substances, is therefore faced with a double obstacle. Not only does the awareness of the non-existence of substances remain sterile in the face of the fact that through language, substantialism is maintained in the very matrix of all the forms of our thinking, but the problem further extends to another level. Unlike the vital embodied errors that are, in the most literal sense, imprinted in the structure of our bodies, in the structure of our senses and of our brain, which have adapted to the maintenance of these vital errors that have been indispensable for our survival for my millennia, the truth lacks such embodiment. It lacks representation in the unconscious field of embodied, embodied instincts. And in fact, it all seems as if truth, in order to become, become a fa factor in the field of the instinctive, must first borrow a body from something which, in all its characteristics, meets the criteria of a vital error. Could it be said that the euphoria with which the discovery of the idea of the eternal return inspired Nietzsche is connected to the fact that he discovers in it precisely that? Not so much a new truth, but what we might call the replacement body of truth, which at the same time as it could serve as such replacement for the body of truth, also contains the vitalistic potential of embodied errors, of unconscious instincts. In other words, that this substitute body of truth also meets the requirements of sustaining life that until now has been sustained exclu exclusively by the vitalistic errors. I think the answer is affirmative, and there are several reasons for this. I would suggest that we look uh, first at a piece of writing which is awfully famous, although I would venture to say that very few people actually know its contents, namely that famous piece of paper on which Nietzsche supposedly first scribbled the idea of the eternal return of the same after it first came to him while observing the famous pointed rock on the shores of Lake Silva Plana. Now the content of this document is quite unexpected. It will appear in front of us. Yes, it did, yeah. So we see, it is entitled the, 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 return, the Return of the Same, Draft. One, the incorporation of fundamental errors. Two, the incorporation of passions. Three, the incorporation of knowledge and the renunciation of knowledge, passion of knowledge. Four, the innocent, the individual as an experiment, the relief of life, humiliation, weakening, transition. Five, the new habibite, the eternal return of the same. Infinite importance of our knowledge, insane, our habits, ways of life for everything to come. What do we do with the remnant of our life? We, the, we, the largest part of the same in the most essential ignorance spent have. We teach the doctrine. It is the most powerful means they as themselves incorporate. Our kind of bliss as a teacher, lehrer of the greatest teaching, Grösten Lehrer. At the beginning of August 1881 in Sils Maria, 6,000 feet above the sea and much higher above all human things. The record is in some ways disappointing. It does not give any description of the idea of eternal return, let alone provide the rationale for its reality, or reveal its, some sort of its secretive deeper meaning. What we do learn is that the key to the whole project of eternal return is from the very beginning contained in the concept of embodiment. Even when Nietzsche says that his task is to teach the doctrine of the eternal return, he emphasizes that the real aim of this teaching, of this emptying of the void, 
is not the spreading of the doctrine, but the teaching must be understood primarily as a means of ensuring that the doctrine will become embodied in the one who teaches it. So it's the opposite order. Speaking of the question of the reality of the idea of eternal return, another crucial aspect must be immediately pointed out. One which has also been recently emphasized by John North and earlier by Pierre Klosowski. For Nietzsche, the question of the veracity of eternal return never seems to have been fatally important. It was sufficient for his purpose to give eternal return a status of a probability. Immediately after the second deduction of the argument of uh, eternal return, Nietzsche writes the following. I quote, even if the uh, circle repetition is only a probability or a possibility, the thought of a possibility can also affect us, shake and reshape us, not just sensations or certain expectations, end of quote. This motive appears regularly also in Nietzsche's later writings, particularly in his letters. But I do not think that it should be understood in the direction of abandoning the connection with the notion of truth. In short, in the direction of reducing the eternal return to a doctrine of life that were per se completely independent of Nietzsche's actual cosmological deduction of the argument. Rather, I would say this, even if the idea of eternal return is a mere possibility, it can still serve as the substitute body of truth. Only that this truth is not necessarily a circular repetition, but the truth of the non-existence of substances. Now, of course, I'm not the first to note that Nietzsche's argument of eternal return is a formal antithesis of substantialism. This observation, observation is already found in Sartre and has been taken up by many others. Nonetheless, it is clearly essential to bring this formal contradiction between eternal recurrence and, the idea, and, and substantialism before our eyes as clearly as possible. I will turn to Nietzsche's second and to my mind strongest deduction of eternal return which is, as we will readily see, in fact, a twofold argument. I quote, again, this is everything, almost everything that I quote here is from Nietzsche's unpublished notebook, M3. The measure of the all force is determined, nothing infinite. Let us beware of such excess of the term. As a result, the number of, of layers, changes, combinations, and developments of this force is to be sure enormously large and practically immeasurable, but in any case, also definite and not infinite. Well, but the time in the universe exerts its force infinitively, i.e., the force is eternally the same and eternally worked. Up to this moment, an eternity has already expired, i.e., all possible developments must have already been there to be. Consequently, the momentary development must be a repetition, and so that which it gave birth and that which arises from it, and uh, so onwards and backwards. Everything has been there innumerable times, insofar as the totality of all forces actually uh, always recurs. Whether apart from that, anything alike has ever been there is quite inexplicable. It seems that the overall situation creates new properties down to the smallest detail, so that two different overall situations cannot have anything alike. Can there be something the same in a whole, e.g. two sheets? <coughs> I doubt. It would presuppose that they had an absolutely same origin, and so we have to assume that up in all eternity back, somewhat the same have passed, despite all, all overall changes and creation of new properties. An, imp an impossible assumption. 
with Nietzsche's thesis is clearly twofold. A, everything returns, and B, there are no equal things, or even there is no sameness, or no sameness exists. More precisely, the only sameness there is is the sameness that occurs when the hourglass of being is reversed and the totality of the world by the necessity of chance is caught up again in the absolutely identical sequence of its repetition. In short, according to the theory of eternal recurrence, the sameness only recurs with the repetition of the totality of everything. In still another terms, according to the second deduction that we are following here, all things are said to receive some minimum of identity, a beingness that the current of becoming does not wash away but returns to things, only through the repetition of the totality of everything which secures them to an infinite number of identical moments scattered throughout eternity. Only in this way, in short, only on the basis of the duality of the thesis of the second deduction, can we say that the eternal return is not only a law concerning the totality of being, but also a thesis on being as such, which determines repetition as the being of beings. The sin of the eternal return taken in its ontological aspect is therefore a scene of infinite diffusion of being, the explosion of substance, rather than the scene of a circle which belongs to the cosmological aspect of the doctrine. And in this respect, the idea of eternal return, even if uh, eternal return as such is not real, clings to the truth in a formal sense. And I'm speaking, of course, of the truth of the non-existence of substances, and offers it its form as a substitute body on which to think it. However, in this way, we have only reached the halfway point, luckily not on the timetable of this lecture, but <laughs> in, in the essential meaning. We have sown a form onto the truth of the non-existence of substances, which, if it is to be actualized must be further incorporated into our body as a kind of microchip in order to gradually reset the structure of our consciousness, which is tailor-made for the belief in substantiality made mediated by language and senses. In this respect, I would like to return to the aspect of the eternal return that we pointed out at the beginning as the most controversial to the selective aspect of the eternal return. The following statement from the time of Zarathustra clearly reverses the elitistic logic of selection usually attributed to Nietzsche, although it can hardly be described as politically correct. I quote, the rebel, cold and without much inner need, will be the first to smile at the doctrine of recurrence. The most basic life drive is the first to give it its approval. The idea of eternal return is by no means presented in this passage as a doctrine for the iron-willed elites capable of enduring the heaviest of thoughts, but it conveys another very important key to understanding it. Nietzsche clearly believed that there is something about the doctrine that persuades the most basic, most rudimentary life drive to recognize it as its own resource. Perhaps one could uh, say that the doctrine was conceived precisely to deceive the life drive in this fashion, because in this way something is being smuggled among the instincts that does not naturally fit amongst them. That is, of course, that is, and this, is, of course, is the truth. But there's another important aspect to this. If we follow this emphasis, it appears clear that the subject that makes the call either to approve or to disapprove of the doctrine of recurrence 
is the most basic life drive. And this is important. There are many reasons why the thought of recurrence might appease or be repugnant, for that matter, to an individual. Uh, for, for example, the fact that in the universe of the uh, return, all our actions echo in eternity, they repeat themselves in eternity. I doubt, however, that this promise of infinite importance and responsibility of our actions that can indeed appease an individual, individ ambitious individual, truly matters as far as the most basic life instinct is concerned. In fact, I believe, even though this is not the only possible interpretation, that Nietzsche at least occasionally inclined towards belief that the doctrine, if it were to succeed, had to be molded in such a way as to fit the role of resource of the prevailing life instinct of the age. And that is a nihilistic life instinct. There's no doubt that for Nietzsche, humanity has entered a new stage of endangerment, no longer determined by a threat from the outside, but from the inside, by the question of whether we even want to survive anymore. This ill disposition to life, and this is highly important, according to Nietzsche, never occurs directly. <coughs> the instinct of life is never erased, but turned against itself. Even what Nietzsche later calls nihilism, the will to nothing, is still a form of the life instinct. This is also why Nietzsche says famously, men will still prefer to will nothing itself than not to will at all. This is still a life instinct, just turned against itself. Now perhaps the most celebrated version of how the life drive in the human being has turned against itself is the famous account from Zarathustra, spoken of by Heidegger, which speaks of the ill will of the will towards time and its it was. This aversion of the will to time and to the will itself is rooted in the growing realization that the will in which the human being sees see their driving force always comes into being as a latecomer only as the re result of the action of forces in which it can no longer intervene. This scapering of the will be uh, uh, behind time can only be cured, according to Nietzsche, by the famous Amor Fati, the will to endure the endless repetition of the same that, if nothing else, restore to the will an end. What is less discussed, however, is that in order for the will to to thus to retain its, its object, the subject must will a form of death in life. This is in fact not so surprising taking in consideration how Nietzsche explains what gives to the human life its tease that makes the direct aversion to life rare and unlikely. Again, it is to be noted that this description emerged during those same days Nietzsche first articulated the idea of the recurrence. I quote, the aversion to life is rare. We keep ourselves in it and in the end and in difficult situations agree to it. Not out of fear of worse, not of, uh, out of hope for better, not, uh, not out of habit which would be boredom, not because of the uh, occasional pleasure, but because of, uh, of the variety. And because basically nothing is a repetition but reminds of what has been experienced. The charm of the new and yet reminiscent of the old taste. Like music with a lot of ugliness. Nietzsche clearly regards the charm of the new, roughly speaking, as an indispensable component of the life drive. It is no less clear that the idea of the eternal recurrence, formally speaking, represents a negation of the life drive perceived in such a way. According to the doctrine, all that appears new is only a step forward or backward, for that matter, on a circular staircase that leads back here, that is nowhere. 
to be more graphical than you in, within the, 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 the theory of eternal, in the universe of the eternal returns, the new is an old man us, nothing else. So what is it then that the doctrine offers to the life drive? To first put it naively, what the doctrine of recurrence offers to the most basic life drive is a promise of eternity which comes in exchange for all that has hereto given life its thrill. A promise of eternity of life which comes at the price of some sort of mortification. What makes this formula somewhat unconvincing is again that it seems unlikely that a life instinct would respond to a promise of an abstract formula without any sort of mediation of the preconditions of sustainment of a particular life form, here and now. And in fact, the two, the received price and the price for it, are strangely wired together and even interchangeable. Namely, what if we must turn the formula around by saying that the eternity received by the life drive is in fact the price that the life weary subject of the modern age must pay in exchange for blissful mortification? In fact, when Nietzsche speaks of the most likely first recipients of his doctrine, he appears to be speaking, though reluctantly, exactly of such life weary subjects. I quote again, ultimately a new doctrine applies to its best representatives, to the old secured and protective natures, because in them the earlier thoughts with the fertility of primeval forests have grown confused and impenetrable. The weaker, emptier, sicker, needy are those who take up the new infection. The first followers prove nothing against the doctrine, end of quote. Ultimately, we could say that the death in life that first appeared as the price for eternity offered by the doctrine is in reality its doorway. The instinct of life reaches towards eternity of eternal recurrence because the life weary subject in the same package receives an appropriate dosage of death in life to remain able sustaining it. Obviously, the idea that the doctrine of recurrence relies on the aimless life form of the life weary, who became so tired of life that they even resent to die, stands in opposition to Nietzsche's later heroic accounts of the supermen who emerge as the one able to endure the heaviest of thoughts. And yet it seems that this doctrine that smuggles the truth which is secured to it on its flip side, regardless of its own veracity, amongst the life instincts, and thus supposedly enables us to finally commence the lengthy stage of life in which life itself will be gradually overcoming its erroneous preconditions, does in fact rely on some form of death instinct. This is why I'd like to finish with a quotation of a less known passage that appeared just a few weeks before the idea of the recurrence first struck Nietzsche, and which can be in more than one way regarded as its prelude. I quote, fundamentally wrong appraisal of the sentient world towards the dead, because we are them, this includes and yet with the sensation, the superficiality, the deception starts. What has pain and pleasure to do with the real process? It is a side effect that does not penetrate deep. But we call it the inside and we see the dead world as external, completely wrong. The dead world forever moved and without error, power against power. And in the sentient world, everything is wrong, arrogant. It is a festival to pass from this world into the dead world. And the greatest desire of knowledge is to oppose the eternal laws to this false consighted world where there is no pleasure and no pain and deception. Is this self-negation of sensation in the intellect 
The meaning of truth is to understand sensation as the external side of existence, as an oversight of being, an adventure. It takes short enough for that. Let's see through this comedy and enjoy it. Let us not think of the return to the insensibility as a decline. We come through, we complete ourselves. The death is reinterpreted. We reconcile with the real, i.e. with the dead world. Got um, time for some questions? Any questions? Okay, uh, I, I'll start with one. Um, I don't, I don't know how good it is because I was just formulating it at, at the end there. Um, so, so you were talking about the 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 eternal return as being connected to a form of, of death, um, and then you mentioned the death drive as a, as a potential way of thinking that. Uh, um, before you mentioned the death drive, the question was going to be, you know, what form does that death take? Because the thing that was leaping to mind when you were talking there was, was Blanchot's reading of The Eternal Return and The Step Not Beyond, where the, the death kind of emerges as a death that is infused within language. Um, that, that's the result of, a, of the act of negation, uh, where we kind of lose the singularity through the name. Um, and of course, this displaces presence. Um, so this this leads to the, the the kind of temporal dimension of the eternal return. Um, so I know you didn't mention Blanchot, but I was just wondering if, if that kind of is fed into to this in any way. Thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, very good question. Uh, uh, thank you for this. And I will basically move from 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 the back uh, to the, towards the beginning. Uh, uh, yes, I agree. I mean, I di didn't focus that uh, here that much on, on this major topic, which started with Heidegger and, and went to Professor Sartre, but I'm sure they did everybody uh, uh, on, on the on the moment of presence, uh, in the dissolution of presence, which is also kind of a, a major topic of, of eternal return. It's an explosion of, of the presence. The same things that I, I, won't, I was talking about. Uh, Substance could be said about presence, but also it could also be said about the fiction of being and such in, in a certain way. Um, and the reason I was talking less about this is in a way surprising. Uh, usually we associate the eternal return with, I would say, Nietzsche's critique of metaphysics in, in general, with, with this. Uh, with this uh, critique of the afterworld, uh, religious afterworld or metaphysical supersensuous world, which in a way destroys the, the balance of life because by, by post-citing the point of gravity, the center of gravity of life into the afterworld, we, into nothing. In other words, we basically take away the, 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 the center of gravity of life as such. And of course, eternal return, in, in a way, recenters life around itself. Maybe absurd idea or what, whatever way, but it is a formula how, how to, in a way, achieve this, even if it's not real. So in this sense, I would say that, that, that the death is uh, outside. It's, it's this afterlife. It's nothing is, is outside. But. Uh, what is interesting is that in, in the actual notebook M3, and I, I was interested, in fact, in this question of ori Nietzsche's original idea, Nietzsche's thought. Uh, after all, it's not long ago since this has been translated even to English, and in Slovene, thanks to Tadej Trocha, uh, we, I think we were almost here somewhere. Uh, uh, here, it's not a lot of critique of metaphysics in, 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 that, in, in that paper. There is a very strong emphasis on the, concepts, uh, on the concept of embodiment, this idea of, um, of embodiment and transformation. It, it, it seems almost like the, here Nietzsche is really trying to achieve this project of his, uh, we can think whatever we want of it, this alignment of human being, of its uh, uh, reparation of a human being, of, of kind of a rewriting the unconscious 
doing some sort of back propagation algorithm, if you prefer the, the, the language of contemporary computer science or artificial stupidity, in order for the human being to become somehow aligned with, with, with the becoming, with becoming, with the, with, with the flow of becoming. Mm, and, and it's, uh, so in, in basically it's the, the emphasis, is the strongest is emphasis is on embodiment and uh, uh, the, the concept of transformation of, of some sort of change surrounded with a lot of epistemology of the type I, I was trying to present here. Not yet so much with the, the, the problem of language which becomes uh, dominant in Twilight of Idols, I, I guess it's there, there's the most famous formula which says that as long as we remain trapped in language, we still believe in God. Mm, but uh, more on this, I would say, uh, evolutionary aspect of, of, of uh, uh, this, this kind of, a, this emphasis of the, uh, on the embodied errors as what constitutes the instincts and, and so on. Thank you, Alesh. Uh, it was really great, and uh, as always, uh, I have only a couple of questions that you draw my attention to, so excuse me for <laughs> if I'm not, uh, you know, at, at your level in a way. First of all, I would like uh, to ask you, what is the German word for error uh, in Nietzsche? Ha. No, well, uh, time to think. But in the meantime, I will uh, pose some other questions. Uh, the, the, the long passage somehow drew me attention to uh, a certain thing that you would certainly know how to deal with, you know, and this is Descartes, you know. Uh, in uh, Nietzsche, of course, famously, God is dead, but the idea of God in Descartes deals not with the omnitude realitatis, as usually taught in the, with the ontological proof for its existence, but as Quarry emphasized, with immense potestas, which, which is a force which is immense. And somehow in this passage, uh, we have immeasurable, uh, immeasurable force in a way. So as uh, someone who, who worked on Descartes, I would ask you if there's a relation with, you know. And then perhaps a banal question, but somehow came to me that this is also Nietzsche's dialogue with physics. You know, yeah. the second law of thermodynamics somehow speaks about loss of the energy, and here it's, is, how do you make out of it? Is there any commentaries in the literature, in Nietzsche, etc.? So, uh, that, that, would, that would be my uh, questions. And when you were talking about embodied truth and something, uh, I somehow missed your point, but I understood this in the, in the sense that you are somehow claiming that Nietzsche speaks here about uh, foundation, foundation as a primal lie. I'm not sure the, if I understand it. I, I understand. Sorry, I, I, primal I, lie. Lie. Lage. Aha. Pervotna lage. I, I, I don't understand. Well, you, you, don't, understand you, you don't have to go in this direction. Uh -huh, but somehow uh -huh. I understood it when you were speaking about embodied truth at uh -huh, Eros, uh -huh, et cetera, uh -huh, uh -huh. that uh, it uh, might uh, do with uh, the, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, I, I, yeah, I will, that, I will again be. try to move backwards because, uh, or maybe I'll uh, immediately uh, confess that I forgot the German word uh, for, <laughs> for, me, for me, mistake. Uh, mm, uh, what a mistake I make, yes. Uh, uh, but we shouldn't blame everything on them. So, uh, <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Descartes, yes. No, uh, because I think that here is some sort of, um, some sort of uh, misunderstanding. Mm, Nietzsche's argument of, of eternal recurrence, I mean, basically there are, there are, there are three pre presuppositions, three premises. Two, are always present in, in all of his deductions. And the third is not actually present, but it's, I like it the most. Uh, first is that the, the, the time is uh, infinite. The time is infinite. But the force that w works in it, this, this, the, the, the entirety of, the totality of being, which is maybe wrongly, wrongly articulated by, by, as a totality of, of being in, in becoming, um, is always finite. 
it's always finite, it's determined. It's determined uh, so that, that uh, and, and this means that in, uh, in infinite time, this world of forces which uh, are, uh, stand in interchangeable relations will necessarily somehow get uh, caught into a loop of repetition. The third premise is, of course, non-existence of void. I mean, it's, it's very clear, at least, of the void in this traditional, traditional uh, atomistic sense of, an, of a space for, 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 that we need to move in a certain way, a space where the atom can exist. So, so these are the three premises that, that you get this out. So I, I don't quite get this infinite force because uh, the force is always finite in, 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 the, in, the, in, in, uh, in, in that universe. Then to, to your other question, uh, this embodied errors. Yeah, th this, is, this is extremely uh, Im important uh, topic because, I mean, Nietzsche always, he, this is directly him, in directly this period of, of emergence of the, the thought of eternal recurrence. He, he, on numerous occasions, he poses this equation between this, um, I would say, uh, uh, this em embodied errors, which are basically the, the some sort of, yes, fallacities that, that, that were necessary, which proved necessary for us to in a way survive us, first as mammals, now as human beings. And one of them, the, the one of them is, uh, uh, for instance, the, 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 this uh, sensation that I am an individual. I mean, I cannot survive uh, without that. And according to Nietzsche, this sensation in a way was developed, uh, it was evolved in a, in a sort of microevolution. It's historical, it can pass. We, we can, he says directly that we can enter a stage where there will be no consciousness of a human being. Consciousness is to, to a certain degree, degree not, 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 a, not, not an illusion, not a fiction, but it is fiction dependent in, in this sense. And also his understanding of, of our mind, of, of our brain, is, is, it goes very much in this direction. And I, I think here, here is clear similarity actually, really, with the new computer sciences, with, with, with the development of artificial intelligence, I was actually really surprised how this uh, Jeffrey Hinton, the so-called godfather of, of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence, he used very, very, very similar uh, terms uh, when he explained this, his breakthrough. He said that basically uh, what, what happened was that they moved uh, at the level of, obviously there's this huge amount of mathematics surrounding this and, and necessary for this. Everything here is mathematical, and, but Nietzsche almost failed to become philosopher because he was so bad at mathematics so he couldn't almost pass the, 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 the exam. For, uh, but uh, he, he said that what was crucial was this movement from a logical symbolic paradigm of understanding of human mind to a biological, which is interesting because it is, com even these uh, networks are completely mathematical. <laughs> so, but, but, but biological in the sense that, as Nietzsche would say that, that for instance, he, he always said that our apparatus for acquiring knowledge was not really developed for acquiring knowledge. It, it has other, more complex, more complex, uh, uh, tasks, for instance, sustaining certain vital illusions which need to be part of our brain for us to, to actually exist. So in this sense, kind of, I, so it's not a lie, it is uh, uh, evolutionarily inscribed vitalistic mistake or something. Uh, thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, I would actually like you to, maybe I just missed it or I didn't totally grab it, but can you elaborate on this concept of selection a little bit more? Um, how, 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 as you said, um, eternal return is a principle, can be understood, interpreted as a principle of selection. So how does this connect to truth 
and on the one hand to live drive on the other hand and maybe also um, to the idea of variation variety novelty uh, uh, what what came to my mind was only the Deleuze's interpretation of selection of eternal uh, return as selection and as if I remember correctly, uh, his picture of selection is kind of um, idea of sieve or strainer that, um, you know, like the, 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 those who um, want to find gold in the river mm. is kind of yeah, yeah, procedure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I think Deleuze in difference and repetition also brings a selection uh, as some sort of, also connects it to Plato's as some sort of seed of anti-Platonism in Plato himself, as uh, something that is a um, parallel process of participation. So, but if Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche's philosophy is critique of metaphysics, so this is like, so what is selection? What is your interpretation of selection? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean uh, okay. Obviously, it seems that today I'll be, be moving backside all the time. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not so. Uh, st I think that obviously, Nietzsche is a. It's a very important topic, Nietzsche's critique of metaphysics. But uh, but I think it's perhaps to some degree over exaggerated this emphasis only on, uh, for instance, this war on Plato and, and so on it has its place in his philosophy. That's certain, but. Uh, Mm, I think there's more, uh, that, that this relation is more complex and I would in this sense uh, even agree with you in advance. Mm, regarding this idea of selection, uh, I mean, it, it, it's not the central thing of my, of my paper. I also mm, know for instance, Deleuze, uh, Deleuze's famous thesis that the reactive forces do not return so that there is this kind of, a, as you said, some sort of, uh, some sort of selection. And, and it's important, this, uh, if not for, for anything else, because Deleuze in, in this way shows that it is not about just about idea, uh, a certain idea of segregation of, between people who are a, able to sustain this uh, uh, thought and people who are not. And then, to be honest, I mean, in Nietzsche, there are it, it can be found also this uh, rather obscure or sinister aspect, for instance, here. In, I mean, what, what I was not discussing here, uh, I mean, I was focusing mostly on the notebook M3, but less on the actual book on, on eternal return, which is Das Spok Zeratustra, which is in a way, uh, it is a, most certainly a book on eternal return, but the eternal return as, uh, Bernard Potra said, is, is inside of it missing <laughs> in, a, in a certain way. It is the main theme of the book, but it is not at all a theme of this book. Mm, and from the, for, for instance, from the time of, of, of Zarathustra, Nietzsche clearly was having this idea that the, 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 the eternal return, if grasped properly in all of its uh, Seriosity is something that, that uh, only the strongest will survive, and, and then that the over men who will, um, who will survive, the, it uh, will actually even use it as a punishment for all the rest, and so on. So, it, there was always this some sort of danger of, of uh, pathos here. But in, in my case, I mean, uh, I, I wasn't focusing seriously on, 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 on the idea of selection. I just wanted to point out this, I would say, somewhat surprising, surprising turn in, in the sense that uh, it is, after all, the, 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 the weak and, and, and the seeker and, and, and needy and, and so on who are the first to actually, or the rebel, as he said, who are the first recipients of the doctrine. I, I think this is not so well known in, 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 in the theory of Nietzsche. Uh, obviously, there, then there are probably some sort of metamorphosis we, we would, would have to go on, and Nietzsche is full of this metamorphosis of, in, in, the, in the eternal term. But, but in this sense, uh, it, it primarily has to rely on, on some sort of, of nihilist, uh, of, uh, on some sort of, it, it, it is a, some sort of trap for, for, for the will to, to, to nothingness in, in, in this sense. So in, in this direction, I also understand this um, relying on, on, uh, on uh, what, what I 
I, I would say very cautiously named as a, as a death drive, death instinct. I, I wouldn't like to make some sort of too early parallel, but, but on the other hand, it is very clear that, uh, I mean, the, the philosopher who, invent, who said that the primary life drive of the age is will to nothing has to do something with this, also with this topic as some sort of prehistory. Time for one more question. Um, we got a quick question. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Alish. That was that was great. I would like to go back to um, the initial part of the presentation where you touched on the unconscious, hence open up, you know, like the potential link with psychoanalysis, and specifically something that was also mentioned by Peter earlier. This idea of uh, embodied errors and. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in a sense, your understanding of Nietzsche is that the unconscious is the field of embodied errors, right? And I've always found that argument, which you find also elsewhere, perhaps the strongest possible link between Nietzsche and Lacanian psychoanalysis. That is to say, as you said, answering to Peter, this is not an error in, in Nietzsche and in psychoanalysis. It's not an error in terms of a fiction, which is also the way some Lacanians would read Lacan, mm -hmm. it's a necessary error. Mm? Mm -hmm. It's an embodied error ontogenetically yeah. that, or in Lacanese, that would be an error of counting in ontogenesis, which originates not only the unconscious, but the spaltung. You know, there's no unconscious without mm -hmm. consciousness and vice versa. And that is a necessary error. So, mm -hmm. so far so good. I think like that's a strong, you have that even late Nietzsche, uh, in Antichrist, he hints at that as well. I always thought myself that's a strong link. But then the question is, and I get to my question to you, the point is like, what lies underneath that ontogenetic, even evolutionary, and again, the link that would be strong biological uh, between Nietzsche and Lacan. But what lie, the question is, what does lie underneath in the species, mm, to put it mm -hmm. like that, underneath that necessary error. And if I get you right, but I think like this is Nietzsche after all, you know, uh, what lies underneath there is life. And that is where you, do, you cannot, in my view, have a connection. Actually, we're t looking at antipodes between Nietzsche and Lacan. With Freud, perhaps it is a different story. Mm -hmm. But the question then is, you know, uh, if at the level of what lies underneath the necessary error mm, is life. Mm. What do you make of life in anti-substantialist terms? Because this is my problem with Nietzsche, you know, like there's a critique of any notion of substance in the name of that free-floating substance, however acephalic you cannot, mm. you can think it, which is life. So it is a form of vitalist substantialism. Mm -hmm. But, and, and that would be like my attempt at a mediation with psychoanalysis, I guess if you opt for a more dogmatically Freudian metapsychology, then, you know, Nietzsche becomes again very close to Freud, because it all depends on how you understand libido. And I think there is room to understand libido in Freud in quasi-Nietzschean mm -hmm. terms. But then the problem is intrapsychoanalytic, because there you do have a you know, quite strong opposition between Lacan and, mm. and Freud, anyway. But the question for you is like, why is he not a substantialist? I never got it, because I, I think it's, it's a refined form of substantialism. I mean, yeah, no, 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 I, I, I think it's a very good, uh, very good question. A very good question, I, I, I even think that I understand it quite uh, okay. So, um, I mean, uh, Substan first to substantialism, I mean, I, I mean uh, it's very clear what Nietzsche wants to say. I, I, I think uh, Nietzsche's substantialism is not against Aristotle. It's not against uh, any substantialist author. It's not even against Descartes because substantialism for him is in principle a matrix in the mind or as uh, Holden uh, likes to say, it, it pertains to the architecture of the subject. This is, this is substantialism. It's, it's, it's substantialism lives in, in, in language uh, and in, in the structure of a mind. This is substantialism. So, so it's, it, it's, it's not even a 
polemic, which I would be, I think, directed against any sort of, of materialism in this sense, even though, of course, Nietzsche made, gave very, very high importance to, for instance, Ruger Poshkovic from, from Dubrovnik, uh, early scientist who kind of dissolved the, the, the whole matter. But I think that the, the matrix of, of what he was critical of was not really Aristotelian, Aristotelian substantialism, but rather, I would say, sooner the, 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 the atomism, the, the, the void and the atom, the, 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 this binary system. In this sense, I, I, to a certain degree, agree with Deleuze, this, that, which is, I mean, I, what I want to say is that the, 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 the critique of, of substantialism, what I have said here, it, it could be also said, it's, uh, you could speak about the fiction of being, more, 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 perhaps even more uh, accurate. So in, in this sense, I'm also somewhat skeptical. I, I began with this kind of, a, which is usually concerned as, as uh, the, the center of Nietzsche's ontology, but it's obviously there is some sort of ontological glimpse in Nietzsche, but, but uh, uh, he did not really believe in, in being. <laughs> and it's interesting that Heidegger was so, so, um, I mean, being is, is something that we cannot think. Uh, it is simply something, again, even, even in that most radical sense of, of uh, is there something or nothing? Uh, why, why, why is there something and not nothing? Uh, I would say that it is, uh, for Nietzsche, it would be at least partially wrong because there is no something. It is becoming. It's, uh, what we can know about the thing in itself is that it is not a thing, but this is probably what also Hegel would say. And even on the other hand, I would say that, okay, we, we are right that there is some being, but it, this goes against how we should think, actually, <laughs> Nietzsche's methodology. And then again, what lies beneath, uh, beneath you, you asked? Uh, I th okay, you said life, and I would say that probably, I mean, yeah, the, the, on, on the most in, intuitive level, uh, I would say that the, the comparisons in psychoanalysis and, and, and Nietzsche would be that in Nietzsche, uh, mm, the, the, the subconscious always comes with a piece of a body, with, 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 with a piece of body. It's, it's in, it's in on, this, this is one thing, it's, in, it's very much inscribed. These instincts are all very much inscribed. I mean, the, the sexual instinct takes hold of our body. The, 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 the instinct of cruelty takes, in a very literal sense, hold of our body because we are, it is, for the large part, introverted cruelty that is important for civilization. And then, of course, there are these other instincts uh, for instance, that, that, that are also somehow inscribed in, in the structure of our body. And on the other hand, and I don't think this is, it, it, it seems that it's very shallow, uh, his concept of, it's not a concept, he, he speaks of the term, of course, of the unconscious, because for, for the most part, it is hidden within consciousness, the unconscious itself as its structure. Um, so I hope this led somewhere, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, 